Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So um, I've got half an hour here for the, the presentation overall. I'm going to try and leave a bit of time for Q&A at the end. So any questions that you have, please just think of them as we go through. Commodity markets, uh, interesting dynamics at the moment. We had a what I call a nice commodity cycle. We had one where demand was leading the way, running down inventories in many cases at a nice steady pace. Prices were appreciating in a nice steady way. And now we've had major dislocations, and, and this has some second order impacts. Short term, whole lot of crosswinds. Uh, things moving all over the place, but medium term, I think there's some very important things for the industry. I'll try and highlight that as we go through today. Um, first of all, what are we doing? Well, the problem with a constrained world, and we are in a, a supply constrained world in many cases, is that you hurt demand. Uh, we are taking down industrial production across many regions. So, we had that really strong industrial production growth last year, 7.8% uh, globally. Well, that's coming down pretty hard this year. Number of factors there, slower China, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, look at Europe. Europe has to go negative. Uh, unfortunately, with, with when the, the power constraints there, I think you'll see industrial load shedding in Europe into the middle of the year. So you, you're taking down a lot of the demand side of the equation. We're also taking down supply, but it is natural in this type of environment that you're lowering demand forecasts because we have to basically ration demand to the supply that is available. Commodity prices, though, of course, I mean, this is, um, just look at that left-hand chart there. That's uh, commodity prices uh, versus the 90th percentile of the cost curve. I mean, always, always good to look at to see how the industry is doing. Like for, for the first time in a decade, effectively, um, all of them are trading at levels effectively to try and convince someone not to buy commodities on any single day. And um, that's the, the function of the, the supply constraints we've had in this market, obviously a function of both the underinvestment we've seen over recent years, and also the fact that, I mean, demand has still been relatively strong. Now, uh, what's actually a little bit interesting shorter term, when you have dislocations, uh, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, what happens? Purchasing managers, run out and try and get stuff. And you hear me talk about purchasing managers a bit in this presentation. Obviously, they are the, the marginal buyers of many of uh, these commodities, whether that's a utility in the energy side, whether it's a manufacturing plant on the metal side. Um, but they have been very nervous. When you get a situation where you think there's not much available and you then you get a supply disruption, you jump into markets. You jump in and make sure you get some. It's a toilet roll analogy. We think back to the early part of the pandemic. If everyone thought toilet roll was running out, you, you went to the shop and you got it. Well, we've had that across many of these markets. So you see there, um, right hand side, that's a, the commodity price index, very Canadian specific, because it's obviously we're BMO. Uh, commodity price index is a basically a weighted average of commodities um, consumed in Canada. But you can see that sharp appreciation starting to come down a little, and we'll talk to that um, in the coming slides. What we've had is a situation where if you're that purchasing manager and you already were worried about stuff being stuck in a container in Shanghai, um, global logistics um, still strained, but now, of course, you're either sanctioned or you're self-sanctioning in many cases. And what we've had is a segmentation of, of markets. Um, I'm old enough to remember when I, when I first started doing commodity analysis, we had, I mean, it shows how old I am, but we had a Western world model and an Eastern bloc model. You almost said two separate models. I'm not saying we're going back to that, but clearly if you want, I mean, people like to use the phrase deglobalization. I, I like to think we're getting more segmentation. We are getting um, redefined value chains. But of course, when we've got a situation where one country is very important in terms of supply, you look at their palladium, steel semis. I mean, steel has probably been one of the most dislocated markets out there because Europe offshored its steel industry to Russia, Ukraine. 20 years ago and now cannot get that uh, flow of material. Well, that on that supply side, you've really taken a fair bit out from the addressable base. And that's why there will be a premium, a risk premium in many of these markets uh, for a little while. Europe is going to have to import five to 10 million tons more steel, million tons more uh, aluminium, half a million tons more zinc this year than we might have thought, uh, given the, the disruptions we've seen. Now, it's not just the basic supply side. It's also the getting stuff to market. So there's a couple of things I wanted to flag here. I mean, um, 
European gas prices have been going up, actually, for the past um, 18 months. They just accelerated over the, the past three or four months, given the geopolitical situation. But again, we have a market here where we're calorie constrained. Uh, in the world, we're not have, we don't have enough energy. There's a whole, lot, um, a whole lot of papers out there you can read as to why this might be uh, on a lot more Zoom calls. Great to be back in person uh, conferences, but um, a lot of people out there using data for Zoom, heating two properties, you're heating your office and you're heating your home. So we had basically a step change in terms of global energy demand. And the supply side, again, extractive industries could not keep up. And of course, in Europe, what we are seeing with power prices as high, we're seeing aggressive refined capacity closures. In many cases at the moment, we don't actually have mine supply bottlenecks. We're, we're getting enough mine supply out. Obviously, disruption rates are high. And I would say that in our commodity models, we are running a higher disruption rate than we normally would because of the, the supply chain issues. And you look at the Q1 reports for all the companies that are here, all the companies that have uh, uh, put reports out there. And they're all mentioning issues with consumables, issues with supply chains. That will go on and we will still we will see supply disappoint in many cases just because of that. I say at the moment covered by standard disruption, but we're, we're pushing it a little higher. But then we do have these big one-off uh, cuts, particularly in terms of refined output, that are tightening things with a low inventory situation. And I will talk about that in a minute. But then when we think about even logistics, getting material from one place to another, inherently, we, the past 20 years, we've been optimizing this. We've been getting value chains really efficient and optimized. That's totally broken down. It was breaking down in the pandemic uh, because of, of lockdowns of, of various ports. Now, you're going to see material have to move longer distances than before. There's going to be a lot more working, uh, working capital and working progress. Um, and this will take a long time to get back to normal. I'm, I'm a believer. I mean, we're good engineers in the world. We will engineer out some of the logistical challenges. But the basic fact of having to move material longer distances, that, that really can't be solved. Now, everything we're talking about, of course, is inherently inflationary, and, and certainly inflationary both in the short and the medium term. I put up the left-hand chart there, just the uh, Chinese PPI. Now, China's kind of led uh, the cycle of China, always leads the cycle in, in commodity markets. Uh, that's why I spend a lot of my time focused there. But you can see when we've got uh, producer price inflation running at plus 10% year on year, there is a constraint. And that, of course, starts to hurt demand. Chinese um, commodity prices are high in spite of China, not because of China at the present time. Uh, Chinese demand over the past 12 months has been conspicuously weak, I would say, relative to everywhere else in the world. It really has been a, a developed world, durables-led story over the past little while. Because that inflation has come through, and the end consumer um, starts to feel the pinch from it. Now, of course, we're now at a point where we are starting to see real incomes fall. That durable cycle I mentioned a minute ago, that was already waning, probably wanes a little bit faster now. This is what inflation does. Um, it does hurt demand. And we are starting to see that just in the short term cycle at the moment. We are starting to see things like steel prices fade. Obviously, Asia started to weaken a bit. It's just a natural way of commodity cycles. We, as I say, we have to, uh, and, and because we have, in many cases, commodity-led inflation, we do have to say ration um, that demand to the available supply. But we are now factoring in a drop in growth rates um, across many of these markets. Um, let's talk China. Uh, as I said, China's been notably weak. Look at that left hand chart uh, wire and cable fabricators operating rate. You can see it's been running at the bottom of the, the five year range all through the last year and still relatively weak this year. And the April numbers are going to look terrible. Um, China's zero COVID approach, uh, President Xi is wedded to it. Um, he uh, and, and we had a Politburo meeting on Thursday, which effect effectively said that we're not backing down on this. Um, it is the policy we will stick to, and it is number one priority. Now, of course, at the same time, we're expecting China to try and boost growth. Um, to get that 5.5% GDP growth this year, it's going to be hard. We're going. We're seeing old school stimulus come through. Now, let, let's let's put China in context. What what do we expect? Infrastructure spending will definitely pick up. Um, it's already starting to pick up. I would say the f the first round of infrastructure was kind of November last year, and it didn't work. 
very unusual, but it's because the central government went to the local governments and said, we go and do stuff. And local government said, we have no money. Uh, we haven't sold property. We haven't sold land for the past six months. Now what you're seeing is a lot more central government big ticket projects, uh, the Gobi Desert Renewables, 455 gigawatts of renewables. I would say we knew about it before, but it's being accelerated. Uh, Zhongnan City, the, the big new city outside of Beijing, again, central government funded projects. So you can definitely expect to see that come through. The challenge is, of course, do we see the property market pick up? Because at the end of the day, if China property moves, the whole Chinese economy moves, and quite frankly, commodity markets tend to move with it. So far, limited sign, but prices have stabilized in tier one and tier two cities. Um, but tier three is still weak. You are now seeing more overt listening um, at a government level and, and from the, the central bank to try and boost property, because the property goes, consumer confidence will come through with it. We're still expecting it. I'm giving China a better second half of the year, but I have to say it's on goodwill at the moment and, and what they've done in previous economic episodes rather than anything I'm seeing in the data today. But I, I'm expecting, particularly given it's a transition year, uh, President Xi gets re-elected effectively in November, they will want the economy running well into that point. So China should be a more positive factor in the second half, but the whole zero COVID thing until we're past peak lockdown in China, uh, it is uh, that that may delay that uplift. Um, let's talk about the industry as a whole. Um, so, I mean, with China Week, why are prices so high? Number one, we don't have a supply response. Um, we've lost a lot of elasticity, I would say, actually, in metals mining over the past few years. Um, we've lost a lot of Chinese domestic mine supply which always provided some elasticity. Um, the only one where we're still seeing that as, as notable as iron ore, we are seeing a response there. Otherwise, pretty weak overall. And of course, uh, why, why aren't we seeing projects approved? I mean, um, on this room, we're all, we're all in the mining industry. But this has been an unusual cycle. I mean, to be making this much money and, and particularly looking like this much money will be made on a go forward basis. And yet we're not seeing that many project approvals. Why? Let's imagine you're sitting on the board of a, a Chilean copper miner. You don't know what state the government wants in the asset. You don't know what the royalty rate's gonna be. So you're, you're unsure in project economics. Permitting has never been harder. And you may even have to take some personal liability around environmental um, uh, mitigation in future years. And quite frankly, shareholders are telling you not to go and spend capital. And that's the big difference. Shareholders are saying, give, give us the money back. And that hasn't changed as of yet. Will be interesting. I would say over the past three months, um, I've been getting a lot more generalist questions coming through. Saying, oh, hold on, the, the, this industry is uh, constrained now. Well, yes, that's been coming for a while. But the fact is now we've had the big run up in commodity prices that has really started to, I would say, crystallize that. Um, it will be interesting to see if shareholder um, if shareholders now start looking towards a little bit more pro-growth um, options coming through. What I don't expect to see is the big ticket, uh, the, the projects that will strain balance sheets, but I do expect to see a lot more um, smaller bolt on projects, maybe you get uh, pushed through over the next little while. The other thing, why, why are prices so high? Inventories are low. That's a um, pinch point chart on the right hand side there, just taking copper as an example. Um, the, the little red dot is where we are today. That is the premium over the 90th percentile versus total inventory. Now, I would say there's inventory and there's visible inventory. And the challenge for analysts like myself is the visible portion of inventory is getting smaller uh, over time. But you can see there that inventory cover is quite low. It's not like we're way out of whack um, in terms of today's price with the, the level of inventory cover that we have. Um, it'd be important to see whether that picks up. One thing just in the copper side I will be looking for is whether Chinese smelting capacity uh, starts to recover. I would also highlight that, again, coming back to our purchasing manager friends, um, what happened with LME Nickel was not helpful. Uh, the situation where we had that big squeeze in LME Nickel prices, liquidity has gone out of that contract. It's now trading about half the volumes it was before, but they're now not trusting prices, which is a little bit of a problem for the, the sector as a whole. Consumers, as I say, just getting a little bit more nervous because of that. And again, purchasing managers will pay more than you think they probably should by classic economics for the next 18 months because of they're, they're so nervous with everything that's happened. 
Um, talking market dislocation. So this is this is uh, Crisco Minerals. Um, this is uh, as defined by the World Bank. Um, many countries have worked out over the past few months they're beholden to Russia for energy. Those same countries are working out they're absolutely beholden to China for energy transition. And what you're starting to see, and this is it's no coincidence that we are seeing these critical mineral policies come out from every country in the world. It's because they want to, number one, build more optionality in value chains. Secondly, be less dependent on China. So the dark blue dots there are China's share of refined output in many of these critical minerals, north of 50% in many cases. Again, two things. You look at it and you go, well, I don't actually have that much optionality in my chain. But secondly, it is, well, hold on, I don't control this enough. And you are saying, if you want reshoring, but uh, I definitely think you're going to see more projects. Now, while that's happening, again, it's inflationary through the supply side. Um, the other thing that's changing on the back of um, what's happened with Russia and Ukraine, I'm upping my medium term renewable forecast. Energy independence is a vote winner for governments around the world now. And how do you get energy independence? Well, uh, you simply go away from fossil fuels, you move towards renewables, solar, wind, and also nuclear. This is why we're seeing the, a lot of queries coming through on the nuclear side again. Economics are playing into it as well. I mean, actually, for things like, as I say, onshore wind, solar, uh, they're now uh, more than economically competitive against fossil fuel plants. So this is why you're seeing it's not just Europe. I mean, Europe's the one, obviously, the prime example, because Europe has the biggest problem. But you look at the Indian policy that's come out, China. 30% power capacity installed, uh, 2025, plus 30% 2025 over the end of 2020. And this is metals intensive spend. This is that classic fuel to materials transition. And it's being accelerated by everything that's going on. Short term, we're in an energy constrained world, and I'll talk about coal in just a minute. But for, now, uh, for the longer term, as I say, we are upping the demand side. So what am I doing to my, su my supply demand models? As I said before, we're still not seeing project spending. I'm taking supply out and I'm upping the demand side in many cases. So that medium term problem is getting uh, harder to solve. Also, while we're talking an energy constrained world, well, you have to think about energy efficiency. That's the, uh, we're, we're going to see a lot more policies, I think, around that over the next little while. I'll just use the example of the building uh, side here, real estate, obviously a consumer of about 25% of global energy. We'll start to see more things come through, like uh, smart facades, uh, building ventilation, which was already coming uh, uh, to get better airflow in the uh, post-pandemic environment. All these things are metals intensive. So we're starting to see, as I say, uh, a real secular trend here towards greater metal penetration for every um, fixed asset investment dollar spent globally. Kind of what China's been doing for a while, but I mean, this is really taking it to a global next level. And it's interesting, I mean, if we think about these markets, uh, the past 20 years have all been China growth. Well, now we're getting more balanced global growth. Um, you can't do a presentation these days without, without talking about ESG. Um, uh, I've, I've put up the left-hand side there a slide from, from Glencore, actually, at the BMO Metals and Mining Conference. And that classic, every now and again, there was a phrase you wish you come up with, but uh, metals and mining companies are the procurement arm of the energy transition. That's the sort of thing that is resonating with generalist investors now. You know, getting it. Um, but I do think, of course, we do increasingly have the ESG overlay. Well, what do, what do we see? Um, there'll be interesting trends coming through. I mean, I, I asked a lot about green premiums. Uh, interesting, the one commodity that actually has a green premium, I would say at the moment, is iron ore because it does value in use correctly. But you will start to see um, more specifications that may have embodied carbon in them. I think you'll see differentiates, as I said there, between commodities produced with low carbon power versus low carbon technology to try and encourage investment there. Um, but I do see a lot more opportunities to integrate. Metals and mining needs a seat at the table when we're talking about everything that's, uh, everything that's going on in terms of the change in the world. And uh, the, I've got to be honest, the industry's operated a bit as a silo for the past 20 years. That integration is where the re-rating comes through on an equity multiple side. And we will see that, I think, um, more and more over the next little while uh, as that integration comes through. And very briefly going to talk about uh, a few commodities that are important to South Africa. Gold, I mean, without really going, I would basically say for the gold market, it hasn't performed, gold price has not performed as badly when the headwinds have been there 
as you may have expected. Gold price hasn't performed as well when the tailwinds have been there, as may have uh, been expected. To actually be a low volatile asset class in a world where there's a lot of stuff going on isn't necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, what it means, I mean, we have this gold price, let's say $1,800 to $1,950 an ounce. Say good by historical standards. There's been no real reason for macro asset allocators, and I do think that compared to 10 years ago, when your marginal buyer of gold was a, a retail investor or a jewelry wholesaler, now your marginal buyer of gold on any given day is a macro asset allocator. So they're mandate driven rather than, than price sensitive. There's been no reason for them to rotate in or out of gold. I suppose if we get past big inflation, maybe used as a bit of a funding source for, for an equity rally, but at the moment, uh, we see it as, as pretty stable overall. Uh, platinum side, obviously very important for, for South Africa as a whole. Um, where we're getting a lot of the questions, of course, is in um, the hygiene economy, still tiny in terms of the, the demand side at the moment. You can see there, um, we've done a lot of work on things like electrolyzer capacity, uh, getting up to 68 gigawatts by, by 2030. And um, if we look at it, fuel cell vehicles, still that that um that great potential what i would say i mean everyone goes are, are they a comp and competitive with electric vehicles because they're behind well no there will be a portfolio just the same way there's a portfolio of cathode technology coming through uh fuel cell vehicles have a, a role to play in in uh in technology particularly when we talk about kind of in city delivery trucks where you can run them for a few day few a, a full day when uh, battery electric vehicles may need to be charged so uh, we do see uh, good opportunities there. Obviously, that is offsetting a decline from uh, traditional ICE. But uh, what I would say is that at least the platinum industry has got itself a seat at the table, um, involved in the discussions around the hygiene economy uh, from, from an early stage. And again, that will help in the medium term. And uh, just lastly, in terms of um, uh, commodities, I mean, thermal coal is the tightest commodity out there at the moment. If you're a utility, you don't want to buy Russian gas, what can you buy? Well, you, you have to go to thermal coal. Thermal coal is actually also in the money from a power generation perspective against gas in places like Europe. And uh, what, what's happened there? We've already had the Chinese supply response. I mean, you look at that right-hand chart. China's ramped up production aggressively. I don't necessarily think in a safe or sustainable way. But China's pulled back from this, the seaborne market, and yet the thermal coal price is still here. And you look at what's happened with coal import tariffs being removed in China, you're going to see utilities back in that market into, into the middle of the year. So actually, that is, um, as I say, if we're looking at here and now when we're seeing a lot of demand pressures, that's one where we really are still seeing constraints. It's a, it's, it's a sunset industry. It will be, um, it's gone in the long run. But for now, I mean, certainly that state of execution is, is there. So just lastly, I mean, what, 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 what points do I want to leave you with? So we had supply chains, they were already struggling. But now, purchasing managers now faced with a lower addressable market, they, are, they have panicked. St they will maybe un unload some of that material over the next little while, but they'll pay more than you think they should for a for, uh, foreseeable future. We are in an energy constrained world. You have to expect demand forecasts to come down. They're coming down already. That will continue, I think, into the middle of the year. But we're also adjusting supply as well. Um, a little bit worried about China, just in terms of the delay to the recovery that we may see for 2022 as a whole. Um, but we are still seeing some uh, demand improvement coming through. Commodity prices. As I, I could honestly make the case they go up 20% on supply constraints. They go down 20% because we're really hurting the, the, the sharp end of the demand side. Short term, does that matter? What I think is more important is if you think about the medium term, Everything we're talking about is inflationary. Less efficient value chains, um, higher energy prices, reshoring, um, all these things will drive up prices in medium term. So if, I'm a, if I look at how we're adjusting our forecasts, there's higher medium term pricing. And uh, so that part of that is we are upping our medium term renewable forecasts and, and nuclear forecasts, given that energy independence is a political vote winner. And just lastly, as I say, we are starting to see some interest come through. Uh, it's taken a while. It's not like, from a generalist side, it's not like 2011, um, 2012, but you are as they, starting to see people come through and say, well, hold on, there has been underinvestment here, and metals have that role to play. That fuel to materials transition is getting there. And, uh, and with that, say, that should help hopefully drive a re-rating in the sector as a whole. With that, I think I've got about five minutes left if anyone has any questions.
Oh, question here. So, uh, so the yeah. So the questions. Um, I put my head in the block about Chinese real estate. I think they have. Uh, so, is 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 what they've been doing sustainable? Of course not. I mean, um, and the fact is, I mean, quite frankly, urbanisation rates starting to slow in China. They don't need to build real estate at the same um, same speed. Now, it is so important to the whole economy because so much wealth is tied up in real estate. They can't let it fall. Certainly, prices. So they can't let prices fall, but they've spent the last three years winding developers back in from, uh, from being way over leveraged. So they've taken away some of the systemic financial risk, but they've also taken away a lot of their growth potential by doing so. It feels like short term, they are going to give those developers a little bit more rope again, a little bit more leeway on the three red lines policy. Longer term, they have to look to a, a future away from so so aggressive. Now, the, why do I say I think they'll have to push back in at the moment? Um, unemployment is going up in China. You don't want that. You don't want that potential unrest in a, in a transition year. So I think it's unsustainable. I do have, let's say, steel demand in China down in a 10-year view because look, I, I just don't think they need to keep building at the same pace. But in the short-term cycle, I think they have to lead on property again to, to get things going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I say we're coming off. I mean, bear in mind we're coming off very high price at the moment. I, I, let's think from an investment potential and also longer term. Cop copper is an obvious one. I don't see. I mean, the the what happened in nickel with the LME is very unfortunate because the fundamental market is looking a lot healthier than it was. We're running down inventory during Chinese New Year. Um, nickel is one. So, if I'm looking at, I'm looking at many of these commodities now having to adjust the demand side structurally. So. You can think about commodity pricing in three ways. You can think about it in terms of, I mean, falling markets where you're you're trading into the cost curve like iron ore over the medium term. Once where you can think of incentive pricing, and then more going into this third bucket, which is you have to talk about substitution through the cycle pricing or, or demand destruction. Copper and nickel are two that are definitely in that camp now, where we're having to adjust the demand side. I think the shift towards um, high nickel battery technology will actually have to slow, because otherwise we'll run out. So, I, I think so. I think for copper, I mean, this is a. It depends. Now, a couple of things in copper depends on the aluminium price, because we're talking about substitution. Uh, so I think you need to be three and a half times the aluminium price to get sufficient substitution through cycle. And what's interesting, we're talking energy pricing going up. We're talking carbon pricing coming in. That will push up that that aluminium cost curve. Um, but for copper. We, we may see new highs again. At the moment, I think it's a pretty good price. <laughs> and um, I think if we stay at these levels, then that is just healthy for the industry as a whole. The worst thing, my view for the copper industry, is uh, let's say some of my peers who go for $15,000 a ton. Then you destroy demand now, and I don't have a problem in the medium term. If we start substituting a lot of wiring out now, it will be an issue. So I think it is more sustained at a higher level. Next two years, actually, we have some supply to absorb. So I should see a lower price then, but then the longer term definitely it looks, I mean, it's an easy story for the entire mining industry to, to broke almost. Great. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's my time. Thank you very much all for your attention today and enjoy the rest of the conference.